Hi everyone, welcome to my channel Kobe Things by Varsha. So there's a playlist on Java 8 that we have been doing. Among these, there was a couple of videos in which we were trying to follow a certain format of doing live hands-on coding, like the streams API part 1 and part 2. We replicated the same for comparators, Java 8 comparators, and also recently for Java 8 optionals. Something similar we want to do with two of the most important utility classes, that is the arrays and collections. And what we will do is, so as we know, uh, arrays and collections, uh, dealing with this covers 70 to 80% of the time. The main intention, the objective behind bringing this video out was, uh, if let's say you are trying to do a binary search operation and you are being able to write the algorithm uh, perfectly in some uh, 10 minutes, and that is great. But if you had known that the binary search algorithm already exists at, as part of some utility class like the collections.binary search, then you could have smartly used that. When you are actually trying to write production level code, trying to become a senior developer, these kind of knowledge comes in handy. So that is the main objective of not trying to reinvent the wheel, become a more pro developer, to become a more seasoned developer. You do not always have to write all the algorithms by yourself. Knowing, like the, having the knowledge of what already exists but as part of your framework, as part of your library that you are using is also very important. And Okay, so let's start with something simple, sorting an array of integers. So what is a class that we are going to use? We are using java.util.arrays class, okay, which majorly deals with all the primitive arrays. So we will use arrays.sort and over here, these are the different arrays that we are taking. So let me initialize one array first. Let's take one integer array. And we use over here arrays dot sort. This is something which is something which we use like let's say when we are writing the binary search algorithm. Also, we try to use this operation all the time. How do I print this? Do not do not really print the array reference variable. Always use arrays dot two stray. Okay, and then you will be able to see the contents of the array. And now let's try to run this. Now let's try to run this. Simply, we got all the elements in the sorted order already a lot of scenarios where sorting of array is important. Now coming to the equality, where do I want to check for equality? So if I say that, uh, let's say I have user preferences of two different users, okay, of two different users, and I want to compare if the preferences are equal or not. So I can take two, the preferences can be maybe, you know, a checklist or a radio button of different inputs that I'm taking. I want to check if they're equal. So in that case, this equality can come in handy. So let me take another uh, array where I want to check for equality. Uh, I'll just couple of numbers and I'll just try to print this is equal. Okay. And over here, I'll just arrays dot equals. Okay. And I will call ARR1 and ARR2, these two. And now let me run this. I can see it is not equal. Okay. So this is how we use the equals method of arrays to check for equality of two different arrays. Finding the maximum element in case of an array list. Now, this is coming to list the collection, right? So, first we need to initialize the array list. So, I will call this a list of integer. And uh, here I'll just take new array list and I'll call arrays.as list. And I'm going to supply all the numbers that I want to take in over here. Uh, couple of numbers. And in this case, I can just call uh max element element and i will call collections there's a collections class which is part of java.util and i'll call max so there are two implementations one which takes the comparator and one which just takes the uh collection so in this case i'll pass collections uh the name of the collection which is list one so if i run this i should be able to get the maximum element out of this Max element is nine. Okay. Next is shuffling of elements. Again, why do we need to talk of shuffling? So let's say there's a quiz app and you want to randomize the questions, the MCQs or any kind any kind of question that you want to uh, have in that particular quiz app. So you have 10 questions and you want to randomize the questions. So you can you all, uh, call this particular shuffle method, uh, which is part of this collections class also. So what we can do is, uh, Let's shuffle the entries for this only. So when we use this is we use collections dot shuffle and then we pass in the list itself. If I go into this particular method, you can see that it is trying to randomly permute the specified list. It returns void and we are using the random class over here. Right. So interesting. Right. So now if I just go back and now let me see how does how did it uh, try to shuffle it. So it's returned void. So I cannot really have anything in the return time. I try to print the list itself. 
uh, let's just say that shuffled list. So we got this particular list that we passed in and these are the values. So I'm assuming every time when I'm going to run, this order is going to change. We have 572391. Now if I run this again, the order is supposed to change because it is doing the permutation. Okay. Again, the order is changed. So this is how we have been able to do the shuffle using collections dot shuffle. Going to the next question is finding the frequency of an element. This is something which we always have to do, but there is a very good way to do it. So we have something called collections dot frequency which takes in a collection. So I want to find out what frequency I want to find in which collection. So I want to use this list one and I'll say I want to find the frequency of what number. So I will say I will find the frequency of two. So let me add two multiple times over here also. So I will add another two over here, right? So in one line, we have been able to find the frequency. If I go into this method, so this will return. So if I go into this, it will return an integer, right? So it will return how many numbers in C is equal to this object, the frequency only it is going to return. So I can try to just store it and print it out in the next sysout frequency equal to this. Simple. Let's try to run this. Frequency is 3 for the element 2, right? Next, we want to convert an array into an array list. So how can we do this? So let's say I want to convert a uh, list. Maybe I want to convert an array of... Uh, Fruits, we create one for now this. I have to convert into an array list. So I'll create an array list of type string fruits, fruits list, and I'm just going to say that new array list. And over here, I'm going to take in arrays dot as list which takes in variable args or var args and over here i'm going to pass in the array which is fruits that's it and we can print this out so just print out the fruit so let me run this so this is how we get the list of fruits next is reversing an array not sorting in reverse just to reverse it from like you have apple banana grapes and i just want to sort it i don't want to sort it <coughs> i have apple banana grapes and i just want to reverse the order so just if you don't want to sort and reverse and you just want to reverse it you can call collections dot reverse so i can call this now this takes in a collection or if you want to pass in this array you can also give it like arrays dot as list like we have done over here so let me give this arrays dot as list and we can print this arrays dot and we can print this fruits Okay, so this should be able to reverse this particular array. So we get grapes, banana and apple. Now, I want to remove all the occurrences of an element. Like all the occurrences of an element, we had this uh, array list where we had three occurrences of two and I want to remove all. So we know that there is a method called, uh, this was list one dot remove all. But this takes in a collection. If I pass in two over here, it is not going to work. So I have to pass some kind of collection into it. And if I create a collection on just on one element, I would need some sort of a set. So there's a method called collections.singleton. It is singleton list, sing, singleton list is also there, singleton map is also there. So I'll just create singleton and now I'm going to pass in two. If you look into the implementation, you will find that it will return a immutable set which only contains that specified element. So now this set is only going to contain two. So now if I run this, list one i should be able to remove all the occurrences of two from that and this is how we have been able to remove all the occurrences of two next is copying elements from array list to an array so i want to copy all the elements of an array list to an array there is a method called two array so let's say i want to create an integer array And how do I do this? So let's say I want to convert this list. I mean, I want to copy all the elements of this into a new array and I'm going to pass in new integer zero. Okay, so now you'll be like, why are we passing new integer zero? And why not we are passing the size of the array list? So it is called a best practice in Java in which we are not going to pass the exact size because what is happening is when the size of the array list and the array is going to be different. In that case, there might be a possibility of unused elements remaining in the new array that you are creating. 
and those uh, spaces will be set to null, like those elements will be set to null. So for memory optimization, what do we say is we are passing new integer zero. It's like we are saying that we don't care about what is the initial size of the uh, array that you are creating. This is the list. And accordingly, there is a logic which is happening under the hood in which they are trying to initialize with their given uh, runtime type and the size of the array. It means we as the developer will not have to specify the size. I'm going to uh, cover a detailed video on Java idioms or the Java best practices, uh, which is soon going to be out where we will discuss in depth about this also. So now uh, let me try to print this array list, ARL list, and uh, let's run this. Oh, sorry. Uh, since this is uh, uh, array now, so we will have to do it like. It is array, uh, it's like a list which is turned into an array, right? So we could see from here. Uh, the first one is actually the singleton uh, thing where we have removed two, and the second one is the one which is copied array. Okay. Next question is how do we remove the null values from array list? So it is very simple and very uh, similar to what we have already done over here. Array list, which uh, this array list already has a couple of null values. What we will do is we'll take this and we'll say remove all. Same as what we did with the singleton. So we'll call collections.singleton. And over here, we are going to pass in null. As a result of this, the string list is now supposed to uh, remove all the null values. So I will print this out. And let's run this now. So remove null. We can see apple, banana, orange. And these null values have been removed. Now, sorting a list of strings in reverse order. Remember, we did collections, not reverse, just to reverse the order, not sorted in reverse, but there is another comparator which we can use called collections, not reverse order. So, if I want to sort a list of strings in a reverse order, like the lexicographically uh, order, if I want to maintain. So, let's say I'll take this fruits uh, list and I will say that collections.sort and I'm going to pass in the fruits. And over here, I'm going to use the comparator which is called reverse order. So now the lexicographically, it should be able to reverse it. Uh, OK, fruits uh, fruits was, I think, was of an array, right? So I will use the fruits list. OK, now if I try to fruit uh, print the fruits list after sorting in reverse, it should give me in the reverse order, but sorted in reverse, like lexicographically, like A to Z, Z to A in that order. Uh, Right, so let's run this. Okay, so let me just modify it a bit. Let me add a couple more. Let's say I add cherry. Okay, and let me add uh, maybe pineapple. Also, I'm just trying to make it randomized just to show that it is going to sort in actually in the reverse lexicographical order. So P, then G, then C, then B and A, right? But if it would have been like collections on reverse, it would have been just grapes, pineapple, banana, cherry, and apple, not taking care of the lexicographical order. So now we need to find out the index of the last occurrence of a sublist. So what we have done is here we are considering cherry banana as a sublist, a list within a list in a sublist. And we are trying to find out the last occurrence of this sublist in this list, not the element. If it would have been an element, I could have used the last index of method. But to do this, I need to use last index of sublist. Now, this takes in a source and a target. What is my source? Truth list. What is my target? I have to define that. So, array dot as list, I will create the sublist cherry and banana. Right? So, now this is supposed to store my uh, last occurrence. So, I will just write it as last index, last occurrence, I mean, last index, whatever. Uh, and we can just try to print this out. And uh, here we go. So, let's now try to run this. We got it as five. Now, if I go over here, zero, one, two, three, four, five. This is the last occurrence of this particular sublist. Uh, maybe I will try to remove this. So, if if that's the case, then it should try to return zero, one, and two. So, we got the last index as two. This is how we can This is how we can find the index of the last occurrence of a sublist within a list. So, going into the ID now. So, how do we create an unmodifiable list over here? So what does it mean that you want to create a read only view of the list to preserve the data integrity? So I will call collections dot unmodifiable list. It can be collection map set anything. And over here, I'm going to say that arrays dot as list anything 792. This is integer list. This is the unmodifiable list. So how does it help? Now I will try to print this out and uh, let's see what happens. 
we have got this. Now let's say into this, I want to do some product operation. Let's say I want to add another element. If I do that, can I do this? If I run this, I will get an exception, which is unsupported operation exception. Because if it is unmodifiable list, as the name suggests, you cannot really modify it. There Okay, now creating a synchronized list. We know that there is a keyword called synchronize. If I pass in the fruits list over here, I can also synchronize this. What I mean to say by that is I can introduce thread safety. I can make this particular list also thread safe so that when multiple threads will try to manipulate this list, it will not result in any safe condition or in any in any concurrent modification itself. Although I've covered in detail about the race condition, thread conformity, we are doing a playlist also. You can check it out. So instead of doing this manually, instead of me introducing the synchronized keyword and saying this list needs to be synchronized, uh, what if there are uh, more than one list? So manually, I will have to do it. Secondly, if I have to, uh, if I do this, this doesn't guarantee that all the operations of the list, like adding element, removing, or doing any, uh, getting an index of retrieval, everything will also be synchronized. Okay. Uh, and I will have to manually take care of all the synchronization operations. So the best way to do is a better way, not the best way would be use collections of synchronized list, or you can use, if I just write things so nice, that map, everything is available. So over here, I'm going to pass in the fruit list as my input. So now it will just behave like a normal uh, list that you can do. So I can uh, maybe define this as a synchronized list. list and you can then normally use this uh, as any other list you would use you can add elements into this or draw whatever i'll add one element into this and i will try to print this. the point over here is instead of you trying to write the keyword the synchronized keyword or manually handling the synchronization mechanism yourself you can use this whenever you need to have a touch of implementation but this is not the best way. Rather, uh, even uh, because this this particular implementation has performance uh, hits, like it takes performance overload because it only has it it actually it locks the entire list. If it entirely the entire list is locked, none of the threads will be able to use that, which is going to make your performance slow. So we have also covered one more data structure, the concurrent implementation called copy on write array list. We have covered that in detail in one of the videos of uh, threads and confidence playlist. If you want to understand more about thread safety in RLS, you can check that video out. Of. Okay. Now coming to, now let's try to run this. Oh, I have to just uh, remove this particular operation. So here we have been able to add another item to this. Now I, now if you, Okay, so with that, we will wrap up today's session on arrays and collection. Now, it is not possible for me to also cover all the important methods. Uh, now, we have not been able to cover all the important methods of uh, arrays and collection, but we have tried our best to cover as many important. The point was this is just the beginning. There are so many different things that you can do with collections and arrays, but this was just to give you a head start, a good introduction, so that uh, you can also become aware of the availability of these APIs and methods and start using them to write more uh, efficient code. So thank you so much for watching today's video. Hope you have got some value out of it. And if you have, please don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thank you so much.